Welcome to this Framework Dowsing podcast, episode one from frameworkdowsing.co.uk. Hello and welcome. This is Jane Radford and Chris Bacon. Hi, Chris. Hello, Jane. Good afternoon to you. Um, Right, today we're both tethered by our headphones in different parts of England and we've got together to really talk about the origins of framework dowsing or how we've both got to where we are now, sort of the, the background of information that we've drawn together and experiences that we've had. And what I'd like to do, Chris, is to start by asking you some of that information and where you feel the basis is is, or how you've drawn the information together over the years to get you into a position where you're able to contribute a vast amount of information and resources for the Framework Dowsing website. Right, Jane. Well, I'm afraid it goes back quite a long way, really, but I just need to say, set it into some sort of context. I started dowsing in the summer of 1976, that very hot summer of 1976. Mm, and I remember that one. Remember that one, yes. Mm-hmm. And uh, I very, it was basically, I, I found a, an article in the local newspaper about this lady that was a dowser and she had recommended um, Tom Graves' books on dowsing. Oh, yes, yes. Do you remember, so those? Had, remember those? Yeah, I had that, yeah. And of course, I, I raided some coat hangers out of the, uh, out of the, the, the cupboard or what have you and made some angle rods immediately and found that I could douse with angle rods. And, of course, I went off and brought Tom's books and digested them rather rapidly and I, I got into dowsing like that. It was a, a real sort of full-time sort of activity for me as a, as a teenager, I guess. And um, But as I learned different techniques of dowsing, I, I became so I've become very interested in... Uh, it was really Tom that had um, explained this in his books about noxious earth rays, as they were called in those days, and dowsing for um, these um, noxious earth rays that under people's houses and uh, buildings and how they may affect people's health who lived above them. Okay. Uh, okay. Yeah. And using dowsing as a tool to locate these black streams as they were called back in the back in the old days and using various corrective measures i started to take a great interest with uh, this this kind of thing basically so and you sorry to interrupt no, no carry on yes you you were actually looking at, at correcting what what was then called noxious earth rays or black streams you were actually yes. looking at, at working and negating or, or balancing that energy that that's oh. right yes right. yes and i mm-hmm. i uh, i did this and and i i studied as much as i could about it and um huh. though there wasn't a lot of information that had been published i mean there'd been some um i can't remember who it was now i should have sort of dug this out earlier on but uh, there were some studies done in germany i think in the 1920s or 30s where they'd done a dowsing survey of a Oh, I don't know if it's in Berlin or a city in, in in Germany, and they'd found a very strong correlation between houses that had these black streams of energy or force flowing under them and the instance of cancer. In fact, it was very strong correlation, and this this really sort of captivated my imagination mm. that uh, such a a factor could be at play in our own lives. So I. Um, studied this in great intensity, I guess, and dug out as much information as I could on this. And um, I need to step it forward now into the mm. 1980s. Uh, at about the, just towards the end of the 80s, I had some friends that were involved with a a community healing project. I don't like the word healing, but I'll use it as a conventional label it's just as a label to use right and 
it, it, it was called something called Fountain International, and basically there was a local group that met uh, just north of Bedford in Bedfordshire. Yeah. And I joined this group because they what they would do it that the concept of Fountain International was that a group would choose a focal point within their local community. And this group would get together on a regular basis and they would project to this place a thought form with the intention that this thought form would um, emanate out from this focal point into the local community and balance the local community in whatever form that may take. Hmm. And it was it was an interesting, very interesting concept. And of course, I, I, I felt quite excited about it. It, it was um, I could see a lot of potential with this. But unfortunately, when I got um, involved with this group, they weren't really very serious, as serious as what I was myself about this type of work. And it, it tended to, um, well, it, it tended to be an excuse to get together and drink tea, basically, and, and, <laughs> and natter. It wasn't anything serious enough for me. So, but I, yeah. I, I still carried carried on going to this. Um, group because it well i suppose it was a sort of a social night out at the end of the day i guess yeah. um but um as the months went by i met somebody there and that was barbara that was how barbara and myself met each other and she was very more seriously interested in this concept of uh community healing or healing places um, because she was interested in how the places were affecting people that lived in certain types of places so that's how we how we got together basically right yeah and barbara was more on the um health side the human health side of things and i, I didn't I, I quite honestly i didn't know very much about that side of things and so we had a quite a an interesting overlap of of expertise if you like and i need to fast forward just a little bit more because we Barbara was interested in radionics and I'd heard of radionics uh, when I started to dowse back in the 70s but I thought it was just a a subject for purely for medical dowsing and then I realized that there was more to radionics than met the eye because I, I, I uh, in my uh, studies of the subject I realized that people were using it to treat uh, agricultural um, crops and animals and I thought well this this sounds very interesting and uh, right yeah, yeah. And had that had they do you think the folks who were doing <clears throat> radionics at that time had, had realized that there was a possibility for more or um I think some some of them may have done yes yeah I mean, so I I thought this could be a very useful way of treating places and areas so it really it was a kind of an extension of what i had been doing on the ground if you like so that's what captivated my interest and i wasn't didn't know of anybody that was doing that type of work but though there may have been of course uh, can i can i just say chris mm. yeah. anybody who might be listening that radionics is to give it a very short summary is a form of distance healing so you were looking at using this form of distance healing rather than actually going to the site or or the target that you were you were working with is, is that right or have i that, that's absolutely correct yes and okay. um, because obviously going to the site it, one can only work in a very small area i guess and i i, I saw that the the the, the, the prospect of radionics because you could treat a larger area with radionics i thought there's lots of possibilities with this and it really sort of just captivated my whole imagination about what could be done with radionics now i must say that i've always realized that radionics was a it, it was a mind orientated technology it's something that the esp faculty was doing i was never right from day one i was never convinced that it was the actual physical instruments that were doing the work but the instrument nonetheless was a to use malcolm ray's expression a tuning focus for the mind and a very good and useful tuning focus for the mind mm -hmm. so that's how i how i came at it right now um i 
looked into to buying an instrument, and I know you've been here as well, and mm -hmm. uh, found that they were very tightly controlled by various radionics organisations in this country in particular. And again, I, as you know as well, I, I worked in the electronics industry. I was a signal processing specialist in the electronics industry. So electronics and signals were no mystery to me. And I thought, well, it can't be that difficult to build a radionic instrument. So I, I um, did some more research and managed to find some plans that I acquired from the United States on various different designs of radionic instruments. All right, yeah. Okay. And I built an instrument. I basically took the, the best from these plans and added my own bits and pieces to, to, to the design of the instrument. I built this, this instrument that was basically a, uh, an instrument where you could send a rate to a target or a location, or it could be used as a potentizer where you could copy, put a sample into one of the wells, and you could copy that into a vial of uh, distilled water and make a, a physical remedy. So that was the, the basic structure of that first instrument. Yeah, could you just say briefly what a rate is, Chris, for anybody who's not you know, not not as familiar with the jargon yes. that's used within radionics. Yeah, that's okay. Yeah, um, so I, I, I mean, you use the term numerical IDs, and we're using them in the same context, aren't we? Basically, but in in radionics, a rate is a an identifying tag for a particular or very specific thought form, um, and that is used to effectively tap into a particular thought form energy pattern and through the instrumentation that pattern is broadcast out to the the personal place that's that's a way of describing it yeah we we tend <clears throat> we we tend to use numbers yes i mean yeah. other people do use different ways of doing it but yes. i think i think the most recent one i've heard of is the sangiovini's where their patterns, but it's mm. very similar. similar. Anyway, I'm Sim probably similar. going off course here. <laughs> no, that's okay. It's, it's sim similar concepts. Mm. But the, the so with the, the point, mm. with, sorry, with the potentizer, you're using that number to mm. to create a pattern with, within the distilled water, or I think I've done it with uh, Saclac pills that are used homeopathically potentized. So, uh, yes. Anyway, I've, I've taken you a bit off course. If oh, you that, that's that's okay, that's fine. So um, yes, I mean you you could obviously I've done the same potentized sacklack pills and similar similar sort of operation really. So basically, I had this I built this instrument and um, I wanted to test it out in some way. And Barbara was a practitioner of kinesiology, um, which is using muscle tests to find balances in the acupuncture meridian system. I hope I'm explaining this well because I don't know a huge or can't remember a huge amount about kinesiology these days. No, but, I'm uh, not, not very well experienced in it. I've just had kinesiology sessions. But yeah, that's how I would summarise it. Yes. And during a kinesiology session, the practitioner would find weaknesses, uh, uh, imbalances in the meridian system via testing the patient's muscles. And then classically, the, the, the practitioner would uh, push various pressure points on the, the patient or the patient would touch various pressure points. And this would bring balance back into the meridian system. And I said to Barbara, so it would be interesting if we tried this, if you was to do a kinesiology session on somebody and instead of doing the actual physical treatments on the person themselves, if I was to broadcast in corrective rates and we could see if whether it would strengthen the meridians and hence strengthen the muscles involved. So right. we, we, we tried this out with my embryonic instruments and it, it you know, it just absolutely worked. It was it was quite amazing. I thought this is quite impressive, and consistently too. So we we developed this assay method, if you like, of uh, checking if instruments work. If right. Mm. And 
from this, uh, it obviously gave a lot of confidence in the in the technique. And um, at about the same time, oh yeah, about, yeah, within that sort of time frame, uh, there was a, a lady in Luton that had heard about uh, what I was doing with radionics through somebody else, and she'd uh, inadvertently she was decorating her bathroom with her husband, and they were taking these ceramic tiles off of the wall and I think it was the adhesive behind the tiles it, all, all this dust was coming off of the basically off the back of the tiles and somehow she got um, some of this dust onto her face and I think it was probably within about 24 hours she was a face was completely swollen mm -hmm. and large blotches and she looked a pretty poor old state basically and of course as I'm sure you know they rush off to their doctors and the doctor gave her some antihistamines and some cream to put on this this condition, and nothing happened. And she she carried on like this. I think it must have been about a month or six weeks. I don't actually remember completely yeah. now. But whatever was being done by the doctor, nothing was happening. So she rang me up and said, well, "Look, I'm, I'm desperate to try anything." And, and I said, "Well, look, I, I explained radionics. I explained." radionic homeopathy to her and I said look that's that's how it works um, I can't guarantee anything and she said look I, I'm just ready to try anything so I, I popped over to see her I said can you know can you give me a sample of this dust because mm. I thought I was going to make a no-sode remedy using my potentizer copy potentizer oh, yeah, uh, yeah. yeah and uh, I popped over to see her and of course she, she looked a a very sorry state with all these blotches and swollen face and it's not exactly the sort of way a lady wants to look is it uh, most of the time so no. uh, mm. she was very embarrassed about it and I took a sample of this dust and I said look I'm going to go back to base and I'm going to prepare this remedy for you and I said I'll come back later on this afternoon and I did that exactly that and took her back the remedy I said well look take three drops three times a day and let's see how it goes uh, so she she did that, and um, I went home and I thought, well, there goes nothing. I thought I don't even know if this is even going to work. Mm. And I, I I was I've always kept this slightly sceptical view of, of of all of this um, these sort of things. Anyway, I think that's not a bad thing really. So I went home and I thought, well, I don't know if that's going to work or not. I just I hope it does. And I forgot all about it. Um, three days later I get a call from her and she said Chris she said it's all gone and oh, really totally yes yeah yeah and I thought she was probably being kind to me and I said would you mind if I come over and have a look at you you know said, <laughs> oh, she said no she says come over and I, I went out got in the car and went over to see her and mm. it, her face was back to normal and she said everybody is amazed at this yeah I, I was amazed too Aww. And the doctor couldn't understand how this could have possibly happened yeah. uh, with distilled water. And we yeah. kept in close contact over the coming weeks, and all, basically all was okay. She should ring me up and say, it's still okay. And I think a couple of years later she rang me back and said, I've had no problems, Chris. It's still fine. Everything's fine. So it was a, it was a big boost for me yeah, uh, yeah. Getting, in, getting into radionics, mm. as you can imagine. Um, just from that that incident, and also the fact that this instrument that I built actually worked very well. Oh, lovely, yeah. And uh, that was what really kind of started it off. Now, um, I built another instrument for Barbara, similar design to, yeah. to, the, to the first one, and we we started to busily uh, work away at building up a radionics practice. It all fitted together with the work Barbara had been doing previously and it was I was learning some new things and it was fitted into areas that, that I was interested in and we started to build up a radionics practice and we actually became pretty busy and we had these two instruments and uh, of course all you need is your your radionic instrument and you can the world is your oyster and we, mm -hmm. and we thought that's 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 going to be fine and it didn't work out like that, did it? Because um, mm. as we started to get more and more busy, we were losing the capacity to be able to do the treatments. 
because the treatments are taking longer and longer. Um, I mean, generally, my working day used to be, um, I think, rather, we worked a similar pattern, is that I do all, all my analyses first thing in the morning. Anything yeah. that would come through in the post or anything else that was in the pipeline to be done. And then the afternoon was the, the treatment period where we'd be setting rates on instruments and changing rates, doing all the treatments for all the different patients. And of course, the afternoon became the evening. Mm-hmm. And eventually it got to the point where the evening became the night. And mm-hmm. at the, <laughs> <laughs> you've probably been there. And mm-hmm. uh, before long, we, re- we were so busy that um, I was not getting the finish, the treatments finished until about half past nine. We both weren't getting treatments finished until about half nine or ten o'clock at night. And uh, inadvertently, we, we sort of created this huge millstone around our necks. Mm. And, and I thought at the time, well, that, that's what it's about, isn't it? So if that's how it has to be done, that's how it has to be done. And this was about, um, this was early in 1990 that we were changing all these rates on a regular basis and doing all these treatments every day. Oh, right. Okay. Yeah. yeah. And uh, then I had a, one of those what if moments and... And strangely enough, initially, I was very resistant to my own idea about this. I thought, I wonder if it would be possible to make a, a computer radionic instrument. And I thought, I didn't like the idea of it, because um, I thought, all this is going to rubbish, all these instruments that I'd built. Because the, previous to that, I'd built other instruments to... Um, cope with our increasing treatment load you see and I had all this time and investment in these instruments and I thought if I make a computer radionic instrument it could just, <laughs> yeah. it could just rubbish all this stuff and I, I thought even um, on, a la- on a larger scale I thought it, might ch- it may change radionics the face of radionics forever in, in another way but um, it might have done a bit so um, I I said this to Barbara, I said, well, I'm going to write a computer. So I wrote a very simple computer program that would basically put a set of rates in and an identifier for the patient, and it would step through these rates and perform a, a simple regime of treatments for somebody. And we, we tested this out again uh, with kinesiology, and it, you know, to much to my surprise, it worked perfectly. Yeah, I was just thinking, you know, what earth is going on here? This is this is amazing. And this very simple program became the basis of it all, really. And I thought, well, what we really need, I, I, okay, I could write a more sophisticated program, and we could put all our treatments into it, and it could sit there hour upon hour uh, doing various treatments. So I thought, well, it'd still take a long time to do. Okay. Okay. Oh, so it's it was similar to a, a standard dialed radionic instrument <clears throat> in that you would one set of treatments would go on and then you'd put in another set of treatments. Is is that right, Chris? Yeah, only it was automatic. It would step. It would automatically step through the treatments. You wouldn't have to okay. change anything. Are you with me? All right. Yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And so the machine that we were actually running it on was a, was an old. IBM PC clone and ran MS DOS. Uh, I'm sure as everybody knows that MS DOS was a single tasking operating system. It can only run one program at a time. So I thought, well, what really needs to happen is that there needs to be some multitasking functionality in this. Now, as it happened, of course, just very luckily, uh, when I worked in the process control industry, I've written, uh, I think it's probably a handful of multitasking uh, kernels for process control applications. Uh, when I mean multitasking kernel, I mean a, a, a system that can run multiple programs at one time. So I thought, what needs to happen? Yep, sorry. Is yeah. Um, well, I think we've all got used to, you know, we'd, in 2015, we're all so used to uh, you know, a, a small instrument such as a mobile phone doing numerous things at the same time, and 
this is uh, this is a real eye opener to me. It's, it's sort of going back and understanding that that MS DOS only did one sort of function at a time. So uh, yeah, I'm finding this very interesting, Chris. Sorry, that was all I was. No, it's, it's okay. Yes, it is, it's it's hard to remember, isn't it? It was only twenty odd years, twenty five years ago. But uh, yes, yeah, yeah. I, I do yeah, to understand. Yeah. It's, a bit, um, it's probably a bit mind blowing for people that are just coming into this that are used to phones yeah. that can do all kinds of different things and how it was in the old days. So anyway, I, I started to write this multitasking operating system that the MT uh, MultiTree rests on. And that was in towards the end of March 1991. So uh, is that where MultiTree got its name from? The, mul- the fact that it's doing multiple tasks at the same time that that's right yes really okay that's, that's where that's, it comes from oh yeah. wow <laughs> so okay yeah um so i worked on this operating system side of the software and mm. i think it i think it was working probably in about june or july in 1991 and after getting that more system side of things sorted out i could then start to write the multi-treatment software that rested on the top of that multitasking capability and I, di- I didn't know what to call this thing and uh, I thought well let's just call it multi-treat that's a that's a name mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. but it got uh, it got shortened because it, we, we the command to run multi-treat is MT and we, we started calling it the MT and the whole thing it's been called the MT ever since so it's got this kind of nickname if you like right and the Version one of multi treats. Uh, so I think I started working on it in June or July 1991, and I had something working a reasonable version one probably by the end of I seem to remember the end of August in 1991, and we we tested it out again with kinesiologists to make sure that it was still doing what it should be doing. The radionic treatments do actually work with it, and very slowly and cautiously we began to move our production treatments from the conventional dialed instruments onto the software instrument. And this happened and instruments started to gather dust in Mm. the corner Mm. and all the treatments were being done on the multi-treat until we put everything on multi-treat. And that freed, obviously freed us up masses of time. Yeah. And you, you could come in in the morning, stick the computer on and let it, work away for a few hours and the treatments were done all automatically so it saved us an enormous amount of time to concentrate on other things like um, doing analyses and um, try to further radionics in other ways mm. so that really is the how it started how i got into it and how multi-treat became multi-treat well, obviously over the, uh, the the years that followed from 1991 it was developed and lots of bugs were got out of the software but we were we had a high capacity high treatment capacity um, device and to my knowledge and i think i can quite confidently say there wasn't anything else like it anywhere i've never heard of a, a radionic system that could do have the capacity that multi-treat had it um it's Multi-treat can treat hundreds or hundreds, literally, uh, of different targets and send multiple rates to those targets. I, I seem to remember at one point in the whole operation and uh, noting that there were nearly 200, either 200 patients and or places, animals or plants on treatment at one time. And I think some of these patients had probably five or ten rates so you're talking about a system yeah, that could, yeah. could broadcast out thousands of rates yeah. in a in a few hours and I, I, there wasn't any other capacity in radionics to do that we, we uh, i think we we outstripped and even the, the delaware labs as you know had a, a a treatment room and i think um at the height of their operation there was about 100 odd individual instruments 
so somebody had to be employed to go around turning all these different dials to different settings to put the different treatments on for each patient. So multi-treated totally outstripped that, that sort of mechanical operation. So that, Jane, is how it all started and how multi-treat came into existence. Wow. Well, well, I've learnt something from you talking today, Chris, and it's interesting hearing you going through it chronologically, looking at what is what you know my pathway and um, where it merged with yours and Barbara's, and yeah, it. it I, f- I find it really interesting because, I, you know, noting it down, I think I met up with you and Barbara in 1998 and uh, discovered Multitree, or you were kind enough to share it with me. So, nice. um, yeah, it, it's interesting seeing how the, the two things or the two experiences mesh together. And, uh, yes. yeah, it, it's great. Thank you ever so much for sharing yeah. that. That's okay, Jane. I, I, I think it was, yes, we, we just met up. It was a, a, a chance meeting, wasn't it? And we worked out that we both did radionics and it sort of took off from there, didn't it, really? Um, well, it, it was, a, yeah, it was at a village fete and yes. my husband had gone ahead of me and he came, came back because I was coming across later and he said, there's two people with a stall who do radionics and I've told them mm. that you do radionics. Can you come and chat to them? And I thought, well, I've got little kids, young children. My kids were young at the time. And I thought, well, I need, I'll, I'll just go around. But I could hardly wait to get to, mm. to oh. where you were. Oh, I feel, <laughs> feel honoured. Yeah, I didn't realise this had happened. And then I was just, fli- you know, flicking through files, mm. but but wanting to engage and not look at the the information that you brought along because I couldn't understand it from where right. I was but right. yeah it was it was just right yeah very very interesting how yeah. you managed to be there and this that and the other yeah. so yeah that's uh, interesting interesting connection but um what I, what I was really interested in Jane was how you got started off with with dowsing and how did you progress to radionics and that that's uh, be very interesting to hear uh, your side of the story. Yeah, well, I, I was going to start off by saying that that it's been years of frustration that that led to me thinking, right, I'm I'm going to start something, and then coming up with the name framework dowsing, and really those years of frustration and and hurdles or whatever you want to call them I suppose has given me that that push to to do what I'm doing now and to utilize what went on in the past and be creative with it and get it out there for as as many folks who it seems to resonate with as possible I mean I you I think I started dousing a couple of years after you so I didn't start dousing until I was 1920, something like that. Yes. And it was my sister that had told me about it. And she'd learnt it from a friend, and they were using dousing to isolate food supplements. That they, mm. I mean, back in the late 70s, I think people were becoming much more aware of of what they were eating and and there was a certain section of society that that were really concerned about where their food was coming from and what nutrients were in, were in their food and recognizing that our food was being manipulated and our our fruits were getting sweeter but they got less nutrients in and like you know the organic thing was getting going and the vegetarian was starting to get going mm, so yes. um i ended up with a set of shoes, the tissue salts and a growing, well, it started off on the sideboard, but in, in the end it went into a box and then it went into a cupboard of these food supplements. And so I was very interested in, in improving my health and, yeah, utilising my dowsing for that. Yes. And then I realised that, you know, things weren't improving 
that I was still experiencing problems with my health. And so then I talked to the guy who ran our local whole food cooperative. And I said, you know, I, I need some help here. And he put me in touch with Lucy Biddy. Oh, I see. That was who, the question. Yeah, who, had, who turned out to be a dowser. So, right, of course, yes. <laughs> yep, yep. So it was, yep. it was great to, to yeah, come yeah. across somebody else who was dowsing and mm. not concerned about talking to it because when I was mentioning dowsing to my friends, it was a bit like listening to that. Uh, do you remember there was a, a two comedians and one of them's pretending to be uh, is it Sir Francis Drake and bringing potatoes back from um, and tobacco oh. back from America and he's telling her friend and anyway it reminds me of that mm. that sketch yes. I'll look it up I ought to yeah I can't I can't recall this at the moment but no no but a, but a fr- you know telling a friend oh well I've got, you know I've got a glass bead and it's on a bit a bit of wool and and then I'm asking it questions and they sort of you know, and then yes, and then what do you do with it? Sort of yes, look yeah, I know. and and I, I know and the so, looks. <laughs> yeah, so you stop talking about it. Stop talking about it. Mm. And whereas nowadays, folks say, "Oh, you know, what you're interested in," and I'm quite happy to say it's Dowson, but we're talking about thirty odd years ago now. Yes, yeah, that's and, right. Um. Anyway, uh, so so yes, I'd I. Lucy was was treating me and she was treating my son and in the end I thought I need to I need to learn this system Mm -hmm. that this I and Lucy put me in touch with uh, a student that she'd trained up so I was then being treated by a lady called Derry Clifford right and I asked Derry if I if she could train me and so this meant um, hooking up with Derry and going over to Wales and spending time with her. And anyway, operations got moved back to rugby. Lucy was only down the road from me. I was living, in, yes. both living in rugby. So I started going over to, to Lucy's on a, on a weekly basis. Right, yes. And that stepped up to a twice a week basis, to a three times a week basis. At one point, we were working very, very closely together. Yes. And she was teaching me her system of radionics, which unfortunately, or probably very fortunately, was quite different to how the Radionic Association were teaching in their school. Yes. Because Lucy had gone off down her own track and followed what she was picking up and really a very, very unique, in-depth system which she had, um, she had card indexes, she had files, she she had logged everything. Mm. And so the, there was this amazing amount of information and I realised I needed to, to pull that together and retain a record of it and amalgamate everything that she had taught me and, and put it into a form where other people could could also dip into that and and if it if it seemed to work for them could also use it yes yes because i I'd, I'd i'd had other i'd i tried i tried um herbal treatments i've been to a herbalist i'd i've been to a number of different practitioners trying to attain a, a sense of health and vitality, but it was only this lady and the lady that and, and Derry. It was only Lucy and Derry. Yes. That that seemed to move me forward. Yes. And I couldn't, from looking at the way Lucy worked, it seemed so all-encompassing, and you know, m- mental mental and emotional problems, first aid, ingrained physical conditions, hereditary conditions, they all seemed approachable with her technique. I'm, yes, not, I mean, I'm, I'm yeah. not saying that she would be 100% successful, but she would uh, approach any case yes. if, if, the, if the person seemed to have the right attitude 
towards that treatment and um, yes. that's a, probably a bit of a vague term but no, no. But, but it is a it is a very that's what we found that radiox is a very all-encompassing subject it, it does tie lots of things together so yes i do understand that uh, entirely jane yes i'm I'm, and I dare say other people would say that, that their therapies or their techniques are, are all encompassing as well. But for me, it was this this approach that that seemed to be a large jigsaw that you could keep adding on to, which yes. is what, when I met you and Barbara, was what I learnt from you and Barbara. And I, so I'd, I'd spent quite a big chunk of time. I'd spent... Uh, from 1988 until shortly before Lucy died, it was a big chunk of time that I spent working very closely with her. Yes. Mm. And it was when I met... So I had really quite rigid views about radionics, how radionics worked, why it worked, and what mm. you could and couldn't do with it. Yes. And it was meeting you and Barbara and saying... And, and questioning it or, or allowing me to reflect on what I was saying and whether it, I did continue to feel that what I was saying was what I continued to believe. Yes. And I'm extremely grateful to you and Barbara for, for not, you know, pointing the finger or, or being hard about it, but just, oh, Right, so you think it's the instrument that's doing the work, or I remember saying to Barbara once, well, you can't treat a space, mm. and Barbara just looked at me, and that's all I needed was that look. <laughs> yeah. to, to, I'm not saying she looked at me in a nasty way, or no, a, no, it was no. a, just a, well, this is a time for me to reflect <laughs> on what's just come out of my mouth. <laughs> yes, yeah, yeah. And, so, so. and, and so I've... I started pulling in things that you and Barbara talked about into my ways of working and 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 being open to other ideas and and things that could be incorporated into the way that I yes. work. Now I was I was suffering greatly under under a, a load of a treat trying to treat all, all my clients or mm. targets that were coming my way. I had one hell of a job trying to get a hold of a radionic instrument. Like you said, they were they were really difficult to get hold of. Mm. All it seemed as though all the instrumentation at one time in in Britain was being exported and sold on the continent. It was yes, mm. Mm. and. Uh, Okay, but why was I finding it so <laughs> difficult mm. to get hold of <laughs> to something? Get one, yes. yeah. um, and, you know, I was going on wild goose chases down to, I remember going down to Poole for a conference that was going on where Lucy had, had linked me up with somebody who was going to sell me her radionic instrument, um, you know, paid for a... To, to be part of this conference and eat a, a lavish three course meal and, and, and mm. wonderful surroundings. Uh, it was a lot of money, but I get there and speak to her and she said that she's changed her mind. So, oh, um, you, you know, these things that, that take <sighs> up a lot of time and a lot of money and, uh, for whatever reason, um, I did get hold of an instrument and yes, I was still working at, at 11, 12 o'clock at night. And and this is while I'd got young children. I'd got commitments to a mm -hmm. family as well. Yes. But, um, uh, one thread that goes through it all is that is that I've got to keep doing this work. Yes. And, and it's an important part of me. Mm. And it, it, I, it's difficult to put into words. It is, yes, yeah. I, I mean, I must admit, you have I, to keep doing it. <laughs> I, I know, I must. I, I probably failed myself because when I started this, I naively thought that it was my life's work to do this, and I was so driven by it, like mm -hmm. you are now. But unfortunately, circumstances changed. I, I did drift out of it. But um, perhaps with 
uh, framework DAOs in we were doing. Maybe I'm drifting back into it again from a, another point of view. But anyway, I didn't mean to interrupt you there, Jane. It's, no, that's fine. Yeah, yeah. So when I met you, which was around 1998. Yes. And, and I've already talked about th- this fluke meeting, really, because mm, was, uh, the village was a minute village. Uh, and and Barbara can't remember why you were both there or why you got an invite to be there. I think uh, we just. Oh, sorry. I just. It, it was. I think it was just purely let's do it just for the fun of doing it. I think and that was. There was no other motivation other than that. We did. We did. We had just had no expectation of it whatsoever. We just thought, well, let's just go and do it for a day out. That was. That was the. That was all that was behind right, it. Right. Yep. Yeah. But sub- subsequently, we got together. You came over to where I was, and you and you said, "We've got this computer program. You know how how are you treating?" And that, and very very early on, I remember you putting it onto our Dell computer, which still had a DOS function on it that you could access, mm. and it sat on that computer for a number of months. Because no. <laughs> I, to do with it. <laughs> I, 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 it seemed to fit in with my system fine. It had all the input fields that I was using on on my oh, okay. instrument. I remember coming back to you and saying, "Well, um, you can put in the 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 subtle level or the subtle organising energy field level that that I want these treatments to go in at." But it doesn't give me the aspect of it. So I can be treating at the etheric level, but I don't, but I can't put in anywhere that it, it's the karmic aspect of the etheric or that, you know. Right. And, yes. and then I stood back from it and I thought, this instrument doesn't do it either. This dialed instrument, mm. I can't put that in as a field either. Mm. What <laughs> are you messing around at, Jane? <laughs> mm. <laughs> so I got it going and yes, my new treatments or the, the, the the results of analysis of a new analysis on somebody I put into the multi treat program and right. like you I gradually started pushing them across mm. and uh, and and in the end it sort of I'll blow it this is much faster yes uh, and and I'm not having to um, you know put a set of treatments on and nip downstairs and um, peel some potatoes and then come back and mm. and put the next set on i just get it going and that that's it once i've got you know got into the routine of using it <laughs> yes, I know. and in the end it's sort of this is so wonderful you know oh, that's good. um and yeah and and i don't know how i would have carried on and continued up, up to now i think i would have burnt myself out i think so yes that that, that is there is that is the inbuilt problem with radionics is doing the treatments isn't it but uh yes yeah, so luckily you found the mt just in the nick of time like that <laughs> yeah probably <laughs> yeah because i remember taking you know trying to take um dialed instruments apart because we couldn't get hold of any uh what's it called circuit circuit diagrams of them right. and and dairy who'd who'd initially started training me she'd she'd tried taking them apart and she'd got stuck on on creating actually the actual fascia that the the dials go on to yeah that is a problem so, yes mm. i mean i bought loads of potentiometers to try mm. and create one you know so mm. Um, it was great. It, it was when I was building the manual instruments. That was always a, a huge problem because it was tracking down all the materials, and I had to get various people to engineer the the, the panels and all this type of thing. It was, it was a bit a bit of a nightmare just putting one of them together. Um, so yes, I, I've been there too. <laughs> but it was interesting talking to Lucy because she she used to refer to her and she had a lovely big base 44 uh, Malcolm Ray instrument mm. so when I she could put far more treatment through so whenever I went over to visit her I'll be banging my treatments through yeah. <laughs> on hers because <laughs> her yes. she's got an old bank of dials and you know you mm. could get three treatments through at a time mm. rather than just one, one. Just one. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but she was saying she was saying you know she said we need something more accurate than this right. she said something where she said I don't think these dials are particularly particularly accurate and she said we need something like a computer program 
Did she really? Did she and really she, say that? She would. She, I remember saying to her, "You know, you're so open to any new uh, device that could come in, whether it's within the kitchen or mm. or whether it's within radionics." So mm. when I told her about you and Barbara, I think a, a year or two before then, she said to me, "Some there's going to be uh, a couple. There's going to be a man and a woman." I don't think she meant it couple. No, um, two people. That, in that sense, but she's mm. just, a man and a woman, and they're going to help you take it forward. Mm. And I, well, I met you and Barbara, and I said, I think these are the people that you were talking about before. And then, and then I wasn't so sure, and that, you know, and this, um, but I think she was probably right. Yes. <laughs> oh, well, that's that's very. I feel honoured. That's very nice. Yes. So, so well, if, if nothing, yeah. if you stopped helping me now, Chris, it would. You know the amount of help I've had via M- MT mm. or multi-tree mm. has, has mm. been phenomenal. Um, well, I, I, I'm very keen to because I departed from radionics, so I won't go into that why, but um, I I still feel very strongly about all those times where and all this development that had been done. And when I left radionics, I'm really I'm an outsider to it now, effectively. But um, I was always very sad about the loss of all of that information. And I feel that you're picking it up with framework and the MT work. And it's rather nice to see it in, all inside a new vehicle. I actually became quite frustrated. The other one, one of the things that frustrated me within the 1990s was the perceived lack of development of anything within the radionic association i i you know i became a associate member or what have you yes and i realized that as each journal came through every three months that there were no articles on radio no, there wasn't, and, was there? and going along to a conference all the speakers well, nothing to do with radionics. Yes. I mean, they might have been on the other two days. I only went for one day. Mm. But, uh, yeah, that day. And, and I thought, what's going on here? This is, this is a bit strange, really. That, yeah, you've got a radionic association and, and yet there are no articles on, um, radiesthesia and, you know, people actually, using radionics or yes. case histories i always have a good case history well yes i agree <laughs> yes and um, i i found exactly the same thing myself um i think at that time and probably most of the time that it was uh, you know it was a very insular kind of setup and they yeah. were the, the mm-hmm. people that i had come into contact with because we were like yourself though we were uh, full members of the Delaware Society for Radionics. And the the people that one was meeting, that they were very, very rigid people, um, very fixed ideas, and they were, you know, again, very resistant to any form of change. And, and this was something that I hit because we, um, we started to talk about the MT, obviously, and it, it it just caused a, an absolute... We were just shot out from all directions, basically. Uh, the, the people were very closed. I suppose it didn't help. I was I was 30 at the time, so I was still a young man, in quotes. Mm-hmm. Um, but um, given the fact that I'd been in industry developing products and it was younger minds that were developing these products, I mm-hmm. suddenly found myself in this other situation where these very rigid older people... And, and they, they there was incredible politics involved in all this too they're all hanging on for power i saw it in in the radionics side of things so i do know exactly what you're talking about there and i think those people actually held it back um enormously because of their attitudes it it definitely needed a um younger input into uh the whole thing to keep it alive and really uh, uh, with what you're doing with framework i i hope that that it does attract a younger more mature audience whereas then we had a an older immature audience <laughs> and, hopefully, and hopefully you know a, a, a younger mature illuminated audience that's going to take these concepts 
um, from dowsing and radionics and start to put it into operation themselves and hopefully take it another step further. That's that's what I hope anyway. Yeah, yeah, and and what I find amazing about about talking to younger people is they have much more maturity than I had at their age. And I think that's overlooked by a lot of older people. Uh, I don't know. I feel as though I experienced, certainly from Lucy uh, and other older, and perhaps it was just our age group or something, that, that you didn't really know anything mm. and, and until you, you know, got at least to be 45 or something like that. So, yes, and it's such a shame because you, you're just brushing away uh, a, a different way of looking at something or, yes. or looking at something from a different angle. Yeah. And, uh, yeah, the, the book Mr. God, This Is Anna comes to mind where she talks about God having all points of view, whereas mm. as humans we're only capable of having certain points of view. And, and, and I always try, I'm probably not, particularly well but I always try and look at things from as many points of view as I can and I think yes. I mean I mean I just got this amazing feeling of stagnation oh and, yes and, and, it, and elitism from the Elitis- radio oh section. absolutely yes yeah. so, I mean I uh, when the Diana De, uh, Della War need Della War um, towards the she re- retired and the, the Della War Society really broke down after she retired but uh, one of the last meetings I went to there was a chap there and I felt quite humbled by what he said um, his name was Ron and he was a very he was a very quiet man and he was a very knowledgeable person as well he, he exuded this knowledge though he, he just kept himself to himself and um, Ron had obviously been summarising over the years of what we'd been doing and what everybody else had been doing. He turned round to us at a meeting, Barbara and myself. He said, "He said, well, quite honestly, he said, I think it's these two that are, that hold mm-hmm. the key to the future of radionics." And I felt really quite humbled by that. But unfortunately, um, from my own perspective, uh, I never was able to live up to that uh, what he said. But nevertheless, it was very nice of him to say, and he was a very open-minded person. But the other ones were so they were so against any new developments or research and I, I think that's really what what has killed most of this off really unfortunately so it'd be it'd be nice to see a, a resurgence of this um, information getting back out there again yeah and I, I think the other thing for me chris is that that i, I mean the internet has allowed people to be so generous with information and knowledge so you can go on the internet and if if, if you're trying to soundproof a, a bedroom which is uh, or you or you you're trying to fix your shower or you're trying to find out more about um Beauchamp that like yesterday I was looking up about um Beauchamp and his theories you know he was sort of way ahead of Pasteur Yes. It's there, and people have have shared mm. it. And mm. and what I'd like to do is get as much out there that and for people to to dib into and 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 use. And and if if it if they find it works, to to get on and do it. Yes. And, and mm. you know, mm. I'm so generous of you to put multi treat seven. Yes. Allow us to put Multitreat 7 onto the framework dowsing website. So yes. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's not lost, is it then? And hopefully folks can pick it up. I mean, I, I, I've said to you a number of times that it, it's, a, it's a, I suppose, a fairly old piece of software, but it's a very functional piece of software. It doesn't have um, lots of flashing lights and bells and whistles, but it does what it says it can do. Mm. It, was a, mm. it was always designed to be a utilitarian program it was never designed to be uh, pleasing on the eye but nevertheless uh, it was a design for a real purpose and, and and that's that was its job and that's what it did so there you have it yeah and you know i don't really want something that takes over the whole of my computer mm-hmm. screen that i can um almost be aware that it's not there um 
and ticking through that I can just then disassociate from the treatments yes. that are going out. But yes. that is a subject for another <laughs> I think it probably podcast. is, isn't it? Yes, I know it is. <laughs> so um, I think what I'll do is I'll say thanks ever so much, Chris. Yeah, thank you, James. Um, nice to talk to you. Yeah, it always is nice to talk yeah. to you. And, and, you know, I hope other folks can can enjoy the the way that subjects go around in the future on future podcasts and, yes yeah. and uh, and yeah if somebody finds them interesting great yeah please hop onto the website thank you for listening we have free information including the multi-treat software available on the website frameworkdousing.co.uk Please visit for loads more information including courses, tutorials and talks.